Welcome. This recorded Policy Spotlight provides LEA's information regarding House Bill 149 and responds to questions submitted by stakeholders. This webinar was originally provided on October 27, 2017. Presenting today is Beth Gilchrist, Literacy Consultant for the Southeast Region, Carol Moffat, Personnel Development Consultant, myself, Lynn Loser, Specific Learning Disabilities and ADHD Statewide Consultant, with contributions from Carol Ann Hudgens, Section Chief, Policy, Monitoring, and Audit. This technical assistance webinar is intended to provide LEAs information regarding House Bill 149, Session Law 2017-127, an act to, to require the State Board of Education and local boards of education to develop tools to ensure identification of students with dyslexia, and dyscalculia. Prior to the October webinar, we solicited questions from stakeholders. Those questions will be responded to throughout this webinar. In addition, EC Division staff will provide information on the origin and context for the policy change, provide an analysis and interpretation of the legislation. This recording PowerPoint slides and facilitator notes will be posted on the EC Division website, as well as written responses to the questions received. Origin and Context The legislation was initiated through a grassroots movement driven by families, and other interested stakeholders concerned with the limited access to educational interventions for dyslexia and other language-based learning disabilities. The mission is to raise dyslexia awareness, empower families, and inform policymakers. A link to the legislation is provided on this slide. I will we'll begin by providing a broad overview of the requirements of the legislation. The primary function of the legislation is to ensure that all students with specific learning disabilities receive necessary screenings, assessments, and special education services. The bill has four major components. The first requirement is for the definition of dyslexia to be included in North Carolina policies governing services for children with disabilities. The definition within the legislation was presented and approved at the August 2017 meeting of the State Board of Education and added to policies governing services for children with disabilities. For further information, See the memo from the Exceptional Children Division dated August 16, 2017. The second requirement is to ensure that ongoing professional development opportunities are made available to teachers and other school personnel on the identification of and interventions for dyslexia, dyscalculia, and other specific learning disabilities. The third requirement is that the State Board of Education develop and make available information electronically to parents, educators, and other concerned groups that provides data concerning characteristics of children with dyslexia, educational methodologies, screenings, and information on what is available to support the work with children. Finally, the fourth requirement requires that local boards of education 
review the diagnostic tools and screening instruments used for dyslexia, dyscalculia, or other specific learning disabilities to ensure that they are age appropriate and effective and determine if additional tools are needed. We will now examine each of these areas in further detail. First, let's take a look at the definition of dyslexia that was added to North Carolina policies governing services for children with disabilities. I'll give you a minute to review this definition. The definition provided in the legislation is the most widely recognized definition used in the United States, both by the educational and the research community. This definition was adopted by the Board of the International Dyslexia Association in 2002 and is also used by the National Institutes of Child Health and Human Development. We've included this definition in the dyslexia topic brief and we take time to unpack the components of this definition within the deep dive into dyslexia professional development. It's important to note that dyslexia has been included as a, uh, as in a subtype of a specific learning disability in the Individuals, of Dis Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, since 19, 1975. The inclusion of the definition within policy does not create a new category of eligibility, but simply defines one of the subtypes of a learning disability. Within the definition, we find that dyslexia is a language-based learning disability, characterized by difficulties with word recognition, poor spelling, and decoding, and is directly influenced by core deficit in the phonological component of language. In other words, difficulty processing the sounds of spoken and written language. Dyslexia is unexpected. It's not a generalized developmental delay or disability. IQ is not a factor in diagnosing dyslexia and exists across intellectual abilities. It is an equal opportunity disability. There's many reasons why a student may have difficulty learning to read. Dyslexia is considered to be unexpected when students are provided effective classroom instruction and difficulty persists. Students with dyslexia typically have adequate reading comprehension. But as a result of reduced reading experience, vocabulary growth and background knowledge is impacted. As a result, students with dyslexia may develop difficulty with reading comprehension. Ongoing professional development opportunities. North Carolina has been a leader in the provision of professional development for students with persistent reading difficulties. The North Carolina State Improvement Projects Reading Research to Classroom Practice Professional Development has been provided in North Carolina for the past 16 years and reflects an extensive body of instructional research that includes students with reading difficulties and dyslexia. The principles of reading instruction gleaned from the research and reflected in the training includes the use of direct, explicit, and systematic instructional strategies and techniques. The deep dive into dyslexia professional development was developed in collaboration with Nancy Hennessy, past president of the International Dyslexia Association and director of academic and professional practices at the AIM Institute. What Works, Supporting Students with Word-Level Written Expression Difficulties, was developed by consultants in the Exceptional Children Division and is available for delivery statewide 
through the Exceptional Children Division request process. Professional development for students who have a learning disability in the area of math is currently in development for statewide dissemination. Electronic information for parents, educators, and others. The main page of the Exceptional Children Division website has a link to a page with materials of interest to parents and educators, including the Dyslexia Topic Brief. This document provides information regarding the evaluation, identification, and instruction of students with dyslexia within the school setting in a myths and facts format. This is also available in Spanish. The Dyslexia Guidance Letter from the U.S. Department of Education clarifies that there is nothing in the IDEA that would prohibit the use of the terms dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dysgraphia in IDEA evaluation, eligibility determinations, or IEP documents. This page also includes dyslexia fact sheets from the IDA. The Exceptional Children Division is partnering with the Exceptional Children Assistance Center to develop additional electronically accessible materials. Local boards of education shall review diagnostic tools and screening instruments. Let's begin by examining requirements within North Carolina policies governing services for children with disabilities, which includes a definition of screening. This definition includes universal screening that is conducted with all students to identify students at risk of future academic, behavioral, or emotional difficulties. A comprehensive evaluation is conducted for students who are suspected of having a disability. The IEP team determines the assessments needed as part of a comprehensive evaluation. An important function of this evaluation is to provide diagnostic information that supports the design and delivery of specially designed instruction that can be focused on the sets of skills that will increase overall academic or behavioral competency so the student can re realize the greatest gains in achievement. When the SLD policy becomes effective in 2020, diagnostic assessments as a component of a comprehensive evaluation will be required. As an example, for the area of dyslexia, diagnostic assessments would include tests of phonological awareness, including advanced phonemic awareness tasks such as segmenting, blending, and manipulation of phonemes, decoding assessments for word identification, spelling inventories, and fluency assessments. The data obtained from diagnostic assessments can help determine underlying causes to determine the instructional focus and to inform decisions about how to adapt and individualize interventions. Questions that should be answered when completed include, does a student have phonological awareness skills at the word, syllable, and sound or phoneme level? Can they isolate, segment, blend, substitute, add, delete, and manipulate sounds and words? What phonetic skills have they mastered and which ones are underdeveloped? Does the student know the six syllable types and can they apply them to decoding unknown and multisyllabic words? Does the student know and use morphological patterns? How is the student's automatic word reading? 
At what level can they read with accuracy and automaticity? The North Carolina Department of Public Instruction multi-tiered system of support model includes a comprehensive and efficient assessment system that, it, that is balanced, uses multiple sources of data, and is culturally appropriate. A comprehensive assessment system is integral to database problem solving to ensure students is having, identified as having indicators of risk, receive appropriate instruction and intervention quickly and efficiently. It is recommended that all staff and local boards of education carefully read the NCDPI MTSS Comprehensive Assessment Guidelines as the basis for their review of locally used diagnostic and screening instruments for dyslexia, dyscalculia, or other specific learning disabilities. Screening assessments within an MTSS have various purposes. One purpose is to identify students who have indicators of risk and who may be in need of additional support. Screening assessments are limited to identifying students with indicators of risk. They may or may not indicate dyslexia, dyscalculia, or other specific learning disabilities. North Carolina public schools are required through the Excellent Public Schools Act to assess all kindergarten, first, second, and third grade students with valid reliable, formative, and diagnostic reading assessments. These assessments address generally regarded areas that should be screened to detect students with risk factors. Our current K-3 assessment system is sufficient for screening purposes of identifying students with risk factors of dyslexia. The North Carolina Early Numeracy Skills Indicators, offered by the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, is a free optional tool offered to districts for students in grades K-3 that can provide indicators of risk for math difficulty, including dyscalculia. Screening assessment alone does not improve performance. The data must be used to drive instruction. Once students are, having, are identified as having indicators of risk, effective core instruction and appropriate research-based intervention should begin. It's only when these difficulties persist after effective instruction and intervention has been provided that we may begin to suspect dyslexia, dyscalculia, or other specific learning disabilities. I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Carol Moffat, who's going to begin by answering some questions from the field. All right, so the first question that we had from the field was, how does dyslexia and dyscalculia get paired for this legislation? You heard Lynn mention that parents had proposed legislation to Representative Deborah Conrad. These parents used the legislation from West Virginia as a model for North Carolina's legislation. West Virginia's legislation was HB 4608, and it includes dyscalculia as well as dyslexia. Also, there are similarities between dyslexia and dyscalculia. Both come from issues with foundational skills, and both are, are alternative terms for specific learning disabilities. For both, diagnostic assessments are used to allow instruction and interventions to be focused on specific target skill and sets of skills to increase the academic or behavioral competencies. While students with dyslexia and dyscalculia may have additional challenges with comprehension and math problem solving. 
These are usually the direct result of underlying difficulties with foundational skills. Our next question. Will you define dyscalculia so that we will, are all working from the same definition in the same way that we are for dyslexia? Dyscalculia is not as researched as dyslexia. At this point, a universal definition does not exist. For our purposes, we are considering a student who may be considered as having dyscalculia to be a student who has not responded to a validated core instruction in math. Students with dyscalculia characteristics may qualify as a student with a learning disability under the area of math calculation and or mathematics problem solving. This is Beth Gilchrist. I'm going to address a few more questions that were submitted. The first being, why was orthographic processing not included in the definition of dyslexia? The primary issue for dyslexia resides in phonological processing. Dyslexia is primarily a disorder of language and word retrieval. It is not a vocabulary or knowledge-based deficit. It is a sound or phonological encoding difficulty. Orthographic processing is enabled by phonemic awareness and grapheme phoneme knowledge, which are the primary need areas for a person with dyslexia. A student has to connect the letters and letter strings to the sounds of spoken language. They must be aware that spoken words can be pulled apart into the elemental particles of speech. A common mis misconception is that it is a visual seeing letters backwards issue. In order to form connections and retain words in memory, readers must have phonemic awareness, the ability to focus on and manipulate phonemes in speech, and grapheme phoneme correspondences of the writing system. Application of these strategies will develop the orthographic mapping to retain the word spellings, pronunciations, and meanings in memory. Problems with phonemic awareness are the hallmark of dyslexia. The definition of dyslexia in HB 149 and added to policies governing services for children with disabilities was developed through a collaborative effort of the International Dyslexia Association and the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development and adopted by the IDA Board of Directors in 2002. Although orthographic processing is not directly referenced in the definition, the portion of the definition that states it is characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities refers to orthographic processing and its impact on automatic word recognition, fluency, and spelling. The next question, does screening mean universal screening of all students or just screening of students demonstrating challenges? Item A within North Carolina policies governing services for children with disability refers to the universal screening system that is conducted with all students within a multi-tiered system of support. Districts and schools should consider the needs of the student population alongside the efficacy of direct academic skill screening of all students when developing their universal screening system. Current research indicates that historical data, along with other risk factors associated with dropout, be analyzed for all students on an ongoing basis and should be included in a universal screening system in middle and high schools. For additional information on universal screening systems, we refer you to the MTSS assessment guidelines and your MTSS regional consultant. What are school systems required to do differently regarding identification of students? Should specific statements of dyslexia, dyscalculia, and other types of learning disabilities be included in reports and forms? Or do we continue to use SLD identification?
sanctification only. It is important to understand that students with dyslexia will continue to be found eligible as a student with a specific learning disability under IDEA. Dyslexia is not a new area of eligibility. Dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dyscalculia are all subtypes of a specific learning disability. Although they are not their own eligibility area, the Office of Special Education Programs has clearly stated that there is no need to avoid using terms like dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dyscalculia. In fact, it is appropriate and encouraged to include characteristics of these three terms in PLAFs, prior written notice, and reevaluation forms. This more detailed information leads to the special in specially designed instruction and helps identify precise evidence-based practices known to be effective. These terms give more specific information about the disability. For example, knowing that a student has dyslexia will help a teacher understand that their learning disability occurs at the word recognition level. An intervention should focus on phonological awareness, systematic phonics instruction, spelling, and automaticity of reading. These terms help specify the specific learning disability even more. They should be helpful in writing IEPs and providing targeted instruction. How will this impact eligibility decisions since dyslexia and dyscalculia are not specific areas under NC eligibility for SLD at this time? Will this change? This will not impact eligibility decisions. Dyslexia falls under specific learning disability and has been included in the definition of specific learning disabilities since 1975. It is not its own eligibility category. Within the eight areas of a learning disability, a student with dyslexia will typically present with primary weaknesses in basic reading skills and or reading fluency and may show secondary consequences in reading comprehension. Written expression may also be impacted due to weaknesses with spelling and writing fluency. While the IDEA definition of a learning disability contains a list of conditions under the definition specific learning disability, which includes dyslexia, the list is not exhaustive. Dyscalculia is not specifically referenced in the IDEA definition of specific learning disability. However, a student with dyscalculia may meet criteria under the area of math calculation and or mathematics problem solving. A student with dyslexia or dyscalculia can have their needs met under the identification of SLD, provided a strong IEP is developed based on diagnostic information. It is important to remember, though, that an identification of dyslexia, dysgraphia, or dyscalculia does not equate to eligibility for special education and related services. In addition to an identification of a disability, it must be documented that the student experiences adverse effects as a result of the disability and requires special education services. Outside information must be considered as an identification may be sufficient information to suspect a disability, triggering child find obligations. What is the best course of action for students showing signs of dyslexia, but who may not yet be demonstrating delays or functional impairments sufficient for SLD identification? Will these students be identified as having dyslexia? First, we cannot predetermine eligibility status. Students who demonstrate indicators of risk for academics or behavior should receive supplemental and or intensive interventions matched to their needs. Their response to the intervention should be closely monitored. If at any time a suspicion of a disability exists, then the IEP team must meet to consider the available evidence and determine if a comprehensive evaluation is warranted. The best course of action for a student who does not meet the eligibility requirements but shows skill deficits similar to a student with dyslexia would be strong core instruction, particularly in the areas of phonological awareness, 
phonics, spelling, and automaticity. Within an MTSS framework, students at risk for poor learning outcomes, including those who may have dyslexia, dyscalculia, or dysgraphia, should be provided with evidence-based interventions, frequent progress monitoring, and adjustment of the intensity and nature of those interventions, depending on the student's success or lack thereof. Our next question. Many of these things may be answered in the webinar, but we would like to know minimal and best practice levels to meet the stipulations of the bill. Also, bill. also how should these things be documented? Step-by-step -step guidance would be greatly appreciated. To better answer this question, we've organized it by sections of the law. The first section is that about all students with specific learning disabilities receiving the necessary screenings, assessments, and special education services, as well as interventions. In that area, Lynn has already previously talked to you about screenings and assessments. Also, we must make sure that we have specially designed instruction that is designed based on the needs and characteristics of the students based on the information obtained by the diagnostic data. Also, need to ensure that all staff have the knowledge of child find responsibilities to be able to identify, locate, and evaluate children with disabilities. An LEA also must ensure all staff are aware of the definition and screening and within the North Carolina policies. And they must utilize professional, qualified professionals to review the diagnostic instruments that are used when determining eligibility. Also, how can we document this? And we'll talk about this later in the slide, but documenting your communication and sharing the information and the definition with your staff, you would need to document that. And then with our students, as far as their um, screening and their diagnostic information, that would be documented within the MTSS. But if a child is identified through um, as an exceptional children, that information would be documented in the child's exceptional children's record. In section two, section two is talking about providing that definition to be able to identify students with dyslexia and dyscalculia. The definition has been incorporated into the North Carolina policies. And again, an LEA has to ensure that all their staff are aware that we do use the term dyslexia within the North Carolina public schools as referenced by the communication that was mentioned by Beth before. Also, ensure that all staff are aware and are knowledgeable of the definition and the characteristics and instructional implications of dyslexia. And now we'll talk about the documentation. If you have that communication and you've shared that definition with your staff, then you would make sure that you have documented that communication, how it was gone out, a copy of that, if it was sent electronically, it could be posted on your website. There are other ways to document that. As far as professional development, you would make sure that you have save attendance rosters for that. And then also post those resources again on your website. We have to remember though, that everyone is responsible for providing appropriate instruction, whether a student with dyslexia is an identified student or not. So you would want to make sure that all of your staff are aware of these bulleted items. In section three, that is referencing the ongoing professional development on identification and intervention strategies. So, in that case, we're talking about the State Board has to, and the Exceptional Children's Division, provides professional development. And we've already shown those on a slide with visuals of those different um, professional developments. And we've also, um, we have the one on dyscalculia that is in process of being developed. But we have to ensure as an LEA, you have to ensure that you are given opportunities for your staff to attend that professional development that is offered through the Exceptional Children's Division. 
or if your LEA has developed capacity to provide that training, then you could, they could attend it in your LEA. As a best practice, an LEA should provide those opportunities for teachers and other personnel who were involved in the screening and evaluation to be able to attend those professional developments. You can see them on your screen. It's reading research to classroom practice, a deep dive into dyslexia, the science of reading and expert teaching, what works for teaching students with word level word expression difficulties, and foundations of math. The last part of Section 3, part of the law, is talking about making this information available. The information available about the characteristics, about screening and diagnostics, and about methodologies to be able to teach and to support children with dyslexia. How can your LE address, LEA address that? Information is made available electronically to parents, educators, and other concerned parents. As was referenced before, the North Carolina Division of, uh, of DPI and Exceptional Children's Division has a link to resources for dyslexia and dyscalculia on our Exceptional Children's website. Ensure that all of your staff are aware of the dyslexic topic brief and their a link to this document should be posted to your website. You also want to ensure that all staff are aware of the Dear Colleague letter from OSEP talking about using the terminology is acceptable and there's no reason it should not be. In the last section of this law, it is talking about local boards of education and how they need to review diagnostic tools and screening instruments. And they need to determine if they are age appropriate, if they are effective, and if additional diagnostic and screening tools are needed. So, to ensure that, local school to birds education need to have knowledge of child fund responsibilities to identify, locate, and evaluate children with disabilities. They also need to ensure that local boards are aware of the definition of screening within the North Carolina policies. Also, local boards of education may or may not have individuals on their teams that have the knowledge of the diagnostic and screening tools used for dyslexia, dyscalculia, or other specific learning disabilities. And we know from the law that I just quoted to you is they have to review those and determine if they're age appropriate and effective and if other additional tools are needed. So if they do not have those professionals on their team that have the knowledge base for that, they would need best practice would be for them to enlist experts from within their LEA that could assist them in meeting this requirement of the law. Additionally, how could you document that? Well, how you could document the local board's decisions and their uh, review of the screening and diagnostic tools would be, uh, one way would be in their local board minutes. Um, that would document that. Also, the local board would want to read the MTSS comprehensive assessment guide that has been mentioned before. And if they have any questions, to contact their district or regional MTSS consultant. Will you be creating a shared file that has suggestions and recommendations for tasks and measures found to be helpful in the screening and evaluation process for both dyslexia and dyscalculia? When a comprehensive evaluation is determined to be needed for a student suspected of having a specific learning disability, the IEP team would determine the assessment tools and strategies needed to gather the appropriate information about the child. Those tools are individually tailored based on the specific areas of educational need. Extensive time and discussion is devoted to the screening and evaluation process through the Reading Research to Classroom Practice course. An entire unit is focused on assessment and participants are exposed to three case studies throughout the course where they analyze data from diagnostic assessments and develop instructional plans based on that data. Participants are also required to administer diagnostic assessment measures to a struggling reader they currently instruct, analyze the data obtained, and develop an appropriate instructional plan as indicated. 
The North Carolina Department of Public Instruction Exceptional Children Division is currently providing professional development on the use of the NC Early Numeracy Indicators and curriculum-based measures of math computation to screen for indicators of risk for math difficulties and as a progress monitoring tool. For further information, contact your regional MTSS consultant or Matt Hoskins in the Exceptional Children Division. To support schools with the implementation of the SLD policy addendum effective July 1, 2020, and the requirement for diagnostic assessments, further guidance regarding diagnostic assessment processes as part of a comprehensive evaluation for students suspected of having dys dyslexia is forthcoming. In addition, for information on screening and diagnostic processes within an MTSS, refer to the MTSS Comprehensive Assessment Guidelines. This question is requesting information on how best to respond or materials to help respond specifically to parents of students who are already identified with specific learning disabilities in reading or math and have appropriate goals to address dyslexia and dyscalculia, but the terminology had not been used in any reports on the IEP or with the parent. Could this be provided? Although it is perfectly appropriate to use the terms dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dyscalculia when writing IEPs, it is not required. The use of the terms alone is not sufficient. The IEP goals should be written with specific, measurable, and objective of information which describes the student's needs so that appropriate specially designed instruction can be designed and delivered. If the IEP is written in such a way, it is not necessary to revise the IEP just to include the terms of dyslexia, dysgraphia, or dyscalculia. If parents of students already identified with a learning disability are interested in learning more about the characteristics associated with these three areas, refer them to the main page of the North Carolina DPI Exceptional Children website, which has a link to a page with materials of interest to parents and educators. We discussed this at the beginning of the webinar. The dyslexia topic brief, dyslexia guidance letter from the U.S. Department of Education, and dyslexia fact sheets should be very informative for parents. The next question was, what is the status of the work for dysgraphia? A one-day professional learning course developed by the Exceptional Children Division called Addressing Word-Level Written Expression Difficulties Within an MTSS Framework is now available. LEAs in need of this professional development can submit a request form to DPI if the area is not directly addressed in their LEA self-assessment, but a need is identified. Thank you. This closes out our webinar.